Welcome to Second Opinion, the review show here on The Nexus. I'm your host, Brandon Johnson, and today I will be joined by nobody, um, because apparently I'm the only Kindle owner on the network. Um, So we can talk about the new 2018 Kindle Paperwhite. It's kind of silly to do an individual review, uh, but I'm super excited. This is going to be my first independent show here on The Nexus, and uh, we'll have some fun. That should be pretty cool. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO57. So today, um, I wanted to talk about the Kindle uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, first, the Kindle is like over 10 years old now, and I just realized it's probably one of the biggest devices that um, I use almost daily, but I never really think about it as um, a piece of technology. I mean, clearly it's made of circuit boards and a display and all that stuff, but I never really think of it in the same kind of wavelength as I do my phone and my laptop. And I don't think about upgrading it in the same way I think about my phone or my laptop and my watch and my headphones. It feels almost like more of an appliance. And kind of to that end, that's kind of what I want to talk through today. Um, First and foremost, the Kindle is probably uh, the only e-reader you've ever heard of. Um, I would be amazed uh, if you know of other e-readers. I don't know that I could name other e-readers. I had to look other e-reader names up for this for this very episode. Okay, maybe I remember the Barnes & Noble Nook. That was kind of Kindle's only real competition for, for some time, uh, but for real now. Like, are there, are there any Nooks any longer? I, I don't know that. I think Sony used to have an e-reader too, and I think it used to even be called the Sony e-reader, um, which like, if that doesn't scream, um, like this is this is an appliance, not not some piece of uh, consumer technology in the same way as a phone is. I don't really know what does. Um, that said, those Sony e-readers always looked kind of cool. Um, so if you had a Sony e-reader and you're just like a super cool Sony e-reader fan, or if you're like any other e-reader fan, um, well, let me know on Twitter because that's cool and that's awesome, and I don't mean to dismiss you there. Uh, it's just kind of like the Kindle is kind of the 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 500 pound gorilla of uh of e-readers it feels like um when i first heard about a kindle was uh around the time that it came out in 2006 and it really kind of made waves the kindle was like amazon's first major foray into consumer technology at least in my mind uh and in, in the kind of historical record that i was able to take a look and um it was kind of strange because at that point, Amazon, this is kind of before Prime, before all of that, um, all, all of the things Amazon's done in the past 10, 15 years to really cement themselves as both a consumer tech company, as a maker of devices, and also just as like a general retailer. Amazon was really known as a bookstore, kind of in the same breath, at, mentioned in the same breath as Barnes & Noble or Borders, RIP Borders. Um, and to see, to look at those, these photos of the original Kindle device, it's really kind of entertaining. You can kind of see the angular edges to like this very early 2000s notion of what consumer tech should be. And this is kind of before most consumer tablets were a thing too. This is post iPhone, I grant, but it's pre iPad, if I recall correctly. So this is before um, tablets with, uh, with designed user interfaces, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and with LED screens and all this stuff were kind of uh, a piece of consumer technology. When we even look at the phrases used to describe the original Kindle, we can kind of see a little bit of how it's very much treated as an extension of a bookseller rather than um, rather than a piece of uh, kind of uh, consumer technology. So I'm looking at Engadget's review here, and it's relatively brief. You can kind of see from the from the very start that um, uh, that the Kindle was kind of pitted as a as a competitor to Sony's e-reader. Looking at Engadget's review, you can kind of even see how this is kind of set up as um, a a consumer a consumer tech foray from a book retailer. Um, so much of the verbiage here is is describing just how strange it is 
to uh, how strange a device this is for a company like Amazon to make. It had built-in EVDO data. You remember EVDO? Oh, that was so much fun. And you could take this thing basically anywhere in the world and get free, uh, free data to download your books. It's pretty sweet. It had a lot of really interesting uh, interactions for how to scroll through pages, um, how to navigate menu items, and it also had a full keyboard, which is, when you think about it, kind of cool for the time. Now, I remember when, the, when this device came out, um, let's see, in 2006, I would have been way too young to actually make that purchase. I wasn't really reading enough to make that purchase too. Okay, I was reading quite a bit, but I wasn't reading uh, to make that MSRP worthwhile. That said, uh, fast forward a couple of years, I was just starting high school and the Kindle 2 came out. The thing about the Kindle 2 is it definitely seemed like a refinement on what the Kindle, the original Kindle kind of put out into the world. You still have free data everywhere to download your books. Um, you still have that same awesome e-ink screen with a little bit of improvement, I grant. Um, but the thing that really kind of sealed the deal for me was this kind of note taking. Um, so in high school, it was a really big deal to be able to take notes in and about your books, especially as you started writing more kind of rigorous papers about, um, about various aspects of, uh, of literature. And I think the thing, the thing that made the Kindle really enticing to me is how I could kind of search through and look back at all of my notes. So I didn't have to go leafing through and remember which order things were, because you know, when you're reading uh, two books a week, that, that can be kind of a struggle. I remember the Kindle too was one of the first devices that I kind of felt like I bought on my own, right? It's what it's, it's, also one of my first purchases on Amazon, which, you know, thinking back 10, you know, 10 years since, uh, I've made a lot of purchases on Amazon, I think, like, like many listeners may have. It's kind of interesting to kind of situate that and see how the Kindle has changed. So I'm no longer in school, so I no longer have a need for those note-taking features in the same way. And reading is kind of the one activity in my life, the one technical activity that I I don't know what this is, but I really don't think it needs to have an LED screen. I have an iPad and I read on my iPad all the time, but when I'm sitting down to read, read in kind of that same way I did um, when I was a kid, read for leisure and not necessarily to read for, um, for any particular objective, but reading for reading's sake and for the love of reading. I feel like there's something about that that I just don't want that to be part of the same universe, the same mindset as work or as programming or as some of these other um, pursuits that are kind of the the main game of the iPad and of, of my laptop. Kind of as a result, I think the e-ink screen is probably the, the most striking thing about any Kindle product. Um, but also since that, since I purchased that Kindle too, um, a lot of things have changed about the way that we access the internet. So those early Kindles had that um, 3G everywhere for free uh, for life. Uh, that doesn't really kind of matter to me as much anymore because things have changed since 2006. And um, we now have Wi-Fi pretty ubiquitously, really fast Wi-Fi pretty ubiquitously. And so, um, when I saw the option to get 3G on a, on a Kindle Paperwhite, which you still can do, I elected not to because for the most part, I'm going to have access to Wi-Fi most places where I'm going to be downloading books, and then I'll have books um, for the times that I won't. Another thing that's really changed about the kind of uh, model of purchasing a Kindle, though, is that now these devices feel heavily subsidized. Looking back, the Kindle 2 ran me a cool $340. The Kindle Paperwhite this year, I picked it up at Target for about 100 bucks. The other thing about this, though, is that these new Kindles have this notion of um, Kindles with special offers. If you've seen Kindle Fire devices, sometimes they have the same things, even though they're Android tablets instead of e-readers. More on that in a second. I mentioned this mostly to say that Amazon has changed the way that they think about pricing these. Um, 
in a way that I think is really interesting and worth noting. The Kindle itself has changed quite a bit as well. Um, it's kind of strange to talk about specs in an e-reader because oftentimes the, the defining characteristic is that e-ink display, which doesn't take a lot to power. Um, and everything kind of under the hood is um, really only needs to be quick enough to paint content to that e-ink screen. It's kind of like caring about the specs of your toaster or another sort of, or, or like your alarm clock or another sort of almost appliance like device. Um, but nonetheless, there's some stuff that's worth talking about anyway. Unlike many other devices, the Kindle has perfected this pleasant balance of just enough processing power to not seem sluggish, um, but not so much processing power that it's kind of unnecessary or unnecessarily expensive. It has just enough sturdiness to make sure it feels well built without feeling too heavy and just enough of that kind of like high design sensibility to keep it from feeling like a child's toy. Nonetheless, I think there's some stuff we can talk about with regard to each of these verticals. The Kindle hardware has remained pretty similar in terms of ports uh, since the Kindle 2. Um, it still charges over micro USB. I'm sorry, Ian. Um, I was hoping for it to be a USB-C device as well, but it seems like uh, micro USB is here to stay. The other kind of notable thing about the Kindle Paperwhite's hardware is that it's now water resistant. Um, I wouldn't toss it in the lake, but I think people, uh, a common use case for Kindles or a common apocryphal use case for Kindles is to read in the bathtub. And uh, the new Kindle Paperwhites, much like the uh, Kindle Oasis, will also have you covered. It also has a backlight. Now, I hear the Kindle Paperwhites have had these for a long time, but because I was upgrading from a Kindle 2, I kind of never really realized that this was a feature or really a feature worth, worth drawing attention to. But I have to say, a backlight is pretty great, especially if you're reading at night or in uh, dark areas or uh, on a bus where the light might be kind of weird. It's, it's awesome to have that just little bit of assist. Um, I, it's a feature that I didn't know I needed. Now, the Kindle software as well didn't really seem like it needed a ton of innovation. It was always pretty fast and it felt like it didn't really, it needed minute adjustment, but not necessarily a full rethinking. And I feel like that that's kind of what we see here. The same sort of grid layout and everything um, remains, remains the same from the earlier devices. You can definitely see the impact that um, advances in other mobile operating systems like iOS and Android that have brought to the fore. Now it's probably time to talk about that whole Kindle with special offers thing. So the way that Amazon delivers these ads to you, well, actually, let's step back a bit. The Kindle with special offers package is kind of the most common way that people buy these devices, usually because you're seeing one at Target or at Best Buy or another retailer that's selling it on Amazon's behalf. They, um, they mark up the price a little bit because you're selling it at a retailer that's not Amazon but then they discount it again because there are kind of advertising features built into the product. Now you can pay to have these removed, but um, I think for a lot of people, and this is kind of the interesting sort of deal with the devil sort of situation, might kind of just deal with the fact that there are ads. And I'll tell you why. Really the main time that you see these, these special offers is on the lock screen. And the funny thing about the Kindle lock screen is that for the most part, you're not looking at the Kindle lock screen, basically ever, especially if you have a cover, really the cover is the thing that, that draws the attention um, to the device. And then you just swipe through the lock screen and you're ready to go. That said, it is like a $20 one-time purchase. So um, that's, that's definitely something to keep in mind. If, if having those ads at all is frustrating, um, which I totally understand. Some other kind of software features that have come out with a latest Kindle device uh, are Goodreads integration. I actually don't know how long Goodreads integration it has been in the Kindle lineup. Um, and I couldn't find a good indication of when that started, but I'd have to imagine it was with the first Paperwhite generation a couple of years ago. The thing about it though, is that I don't really use Goodreads. 
but a lot of my friends do. So I'm, I'm hoping to maybe as time goes on and use this a little bit better. Goodreads is a service that allows you to kind of track what you read, write reviews and see what other people have, have read and uh, kind of keep tabs on authors you like or other people who read books that you like. Um, so you can kind of share recommendations and, and stuff like that. I believe Goodreads is actually owned by Amazon. Otherwise it has a very strong partnership or strong ties to Amazon. Um, so it's very possible that there's some kind of symbiosis there. A long running feature of the Kindle platform has been the ability to send PDFs and other links to uh, your Kindle device via email. So Amazon will issue you a special email address that anything you send to that goes to your Kindle. And even after all these years, that's probably my number one feature. It's a great way to get um, recipes or uh, PDF eBooks or other sorts of files onto your device for later reading. And it's all done whenever, whenever your device is in a Wi-Fi network. Now this is kind of a fun little in-joke for fellow Kindle owners. Um, the Kindle devices do have a web browser, but even after all these years, it's still listed as experimental. What's more, it doesn't even support Flexbox. So most websites, layouts, and other sorts of features aren't really going to work. It's really best for viewing, like, um, think about like the lowest common denominator version of like a news site where it just shows you the headlines. That's, that's, probably, the, that's probably the best bet. And it's at this point where you kind of see the performance trade-offs that Amazon had to make when building these devices. They're definitely not tablets. They're simply e-readers. That said, especially in 2018, I feel like most folks who want to browse the web are better off uh, using one of their other devices for that purpose. And I feel like that's really a positive attribute and not a negative attribute of the Kindle. So let's talk overall. At about a third of what the original Kindle cost, the 2018 Paperwhite, I, I feel, is a great fit for early Kindle users who realize that their terrestrial device may have bit the dust like mine did. The Kindle upgrade cycle makes me think, this is kind of what the iPad upgrade cycle should be, but for whatever reason, I don't feel like the Apple upgrade cycle is ever going to feel quite as natural as a Kindle upgrade cycle. When my Kindle 2 uh, bit the dust, I, I kind of, uh, I, I both immediately knew that I was going to get a new device, um, but you know, I, I kind of felt like it was time, especially after eight years of solid use. I don't, I don't feel like, uh, I don't feel like I made a bad decision there, or I don't, I don't feel like that trade-off was poor. I feel like um, I got essentially a really great useful lifetime out of a really sturdy device, and um, and the upgrade, the, the changes that Amazon has made um, seem worth that effort. That said, uh, if you have another e-reader that you really like, uh, that's not a Kindle, um, that gets you out of the Kindle ecosystem, I totally uh, think that that's really awesome too. And actually, if you have, if you have recommendations for something like that, um, send it at me on Twitter. One other point I'd like to make is the uh, ability to rent library books, borrow library books, and read them on your Kindle. Now, here in the Minneapolis and St. Paul metropolitan area, we have this really awesome entity called Melsa that handles a lot of those kind of relationships with libraries for us. But one of the cool things that happens is at local libraries in town here, you can borrow ebooks that are kind of purchased by and managed by your library system. And then those ebooks are available to cardholders at those libraries to use on their um, web browsers, mobile phones, tablets, and e reader devices. And Amazon uh, on the Kindle 2 never really had a good story for how to, how to work with that, just because of how long. It's been since that device was released, and and um, as a as a user, I often read on my iPad instead because it didn't support things like OverDrive and uh, Cloud Library. However, the 2018 Paperwhite I realized uh, does actually support OverDrive. Uh, does actually support 3M Cloud Library, and like the the way that you do it actually is is pretty darn slick. You just fire up a web browser and you're able to scroll through, select those books and add, send them to your Kindle. And um, Amazon and OverDrive handles the rest. Your library doesn't, uh, doesn't need to worry about it so much and neither do you. I'm actually reading a really good book right now um, that I got from that. So definitely worth checking out. 
Uh, if you're not in the Minneapolis and St. Paul metropolitan area, talk to your library. I bet they have something similar. And of course, uh, what review of an ebook would be complete without a recommendation of a book to read? I'm reading a really good book right now called Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Station Eleven is, you know, I, I don't know if I'd call it a, a young adult fiction book, but it kind of it kind of has some of those vibes. It's definitely a um, it's definitely a sci-fi book or a speculative fiction book, um, but it, it kind of tackles the um, the kind of consequences of uh, an apocalyptic um, disease outbreak and kind of the resilience of uh, people affected by it. And um, it was actually recommended me, to me by a friend of mine um, who, uh, you know, we, we kind of both had some ties to some of the locations that are mentioned in, in, in the book. And uh, it does a really good job of kind of both featuring the, the place as, as, as a character in and of itself. And it also does a really good job of kind of bringing some hope into a really dark situation, um, which I feel like is always kind of a really positive thing for a book to do. So if you're looking for a book to read, uh, Station Eleven is definitely one that I would recommend. That just about does it for this episode of Second Opinion. Once again, I'm Brandon Johnson. You can follow me, follow me on Twitter where I'm Brandon underscore MN. And you can find me on other podcasts on thenexus.tv. This episode is available uh, under the Creative Commons license, so you can use it for whatever the heck you want to. Remix it, make it auto-tuned. Uh, if you auto-tune me, though, all I ask is that you let me know. I can't like enforce that, and I don't wish to, but if you do, that would be super cool. You should try and auto-tune me. That'd be fun. Uh, you can also discuss this episode on a subreddit on reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. Uh, we also have a Patreon if you'd like to support our work. Um, I don't know that I have particular patrons. Patreon, Patreon, patrons, Patreons, patron, uh, pa pa you know what I'm saying. But uh, I would like to thank all of them, uh, whether whether they should be thanked specifically in this episode or not. That just about does it for this show. Uh, if you enjoyed it, let me know on Twitter or on Reddit or on one of the other places because this is kind of fun. Um, I always like talking about these kind of devices that are almost invisible to us, but are also so important to kind of our daily lives and, and, and how we manage stress and, and, and kind of how, how, we, how, how we do. So thanks so much.